It's Tuesday, September 18th, 2012. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, PAX Prime 2012. Let's do this. You know, we go to so many conventions now. I get the, and we're making less Geek Nights, so a greater proportion of Geek Nights episodes end up being convention episodes. Uh, but we've gotten kind of around that by not doing full episodes about most conventions we go to That's anymore. That's true, but I and feel the like... the Mocha Show is a, is, a, is a... It's a red herring there, because the Mocha Show is just a review of a whole ton of comics. I get the feeling <laughs> what do we, say we about should the mocha? make a separate show that is the, con- like the geek convention show. It's not Geek Nights. Well, we've got to... Then we gotta... we'd be very, very short on Geek Nights show ideas. We've got a, a show like that in the hopper. But the thing is, convention season's basically over after MAGFest. Uh, until? Until what? Uh, PAX East? Which is how far away from Six MAGFest? Six months? No. PAX- All right, four months. PAX East is in like April. And you know what? When's PAX Prime? Not that long after that. September. So it's September. MAGFest is January. PAX East is April. So they're all four months apart. It's So it, it's you get these little... And then New York Comic Con, if you count it, is in between PAX East and I Mag have Fest. a funny feeling we're not going to do a show on the New York Comic Con this no. year. Just saying. I didn't even send my press credential crap in yet. I don't know if I will. And KatsuCon is pretty soon after MAGFest. Or yeah, the when same was the last weekend. time we went to KatsuCon? I'm not saying we went to it. I'm just saying it's there, so it's still convention season. Always. <laughs> not for us it's anymore. always convention season. We're old men now. We don't go to as many cons as we used to. When was but, the last time we went to, like, Anime Next? Uh, Penguin We only went to Anime Next once and Penguin Con once. Yeah. So it's, you know, anyway. UberCon. Remember UberCon? We went to the two or three I times. went to three UberCons. Mm-hmm. I, went to I think two. it still happens. If you went to three, I went to two. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, we're back from PAX, but as you all know, we got other stuff going on, so we're in and out of town. There was a guest episode last week. There are probably more guest episodes to come, so don't be scared. We'll be back once I'm back from India and Singapore and uh, Turkey and Germany. Yeah, I mean, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, we both win the lottery or some shit and just start traveling around the world. Geek Nights will not die. Episodes will just happen whenever they happen. Plus, you know, we got all those video shows and things in the works, but uh, they're not uh, ready yet. Yeah, and you know what? The other thing you got to understand is that even though there might be a dearth of Geek Nights episodes during one of our traveling times, uh, when one of us is out of town, that means the other one doesn't have anything to do in town. Except play Counter-Strike. Except play Counter-Strike, but also maybe... You know, instead of spending like two hours on Geek Nights, it's one hour of Counter Strike, one hour of making a video or doing something like that. So yeah, we won't. We'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get past. That's all meta. Yeah. We're back. We're bad. Video games, talking about them. And one thing that we didn't talk about in all these missed episodes prior was Steam Greenlight and yeah. the fact that it actually happened. Mm-hmm. It's going, mm-hmm. and the community reaction has been surprisingly mixed. Yeah. Well, I mean, there was basically the idea of Steam Greenlight. If you don't know is Steam has a problem in that they want the awesomest games to be on Steam, but they don't want it to be the Apple Store where all the crap in the universe is on Steam. They want to pick and choose you know, the good stuff to be on there. Yeah, ever try to search for a game on the Apple Store if you didn't already know the <laughs> name of the game you were looking for? Right, so... You know, but the problem is they don't have enough manpower at Valve to know which games are to look at. You know, there's so many games they can't look at them all. So what do they even do about that? You know, they they so they crowdsource it. They basically sort of make a Reddit ish of you know game submissions, and the games that get voted all the way up are the ones they'll take a look at to see if they can get them on Steam. Great idea. Problem. Day one they put this up, and it's full of crap. We're not talking crap. We're like, talking like straight up spam, like Viagra spam that pretended to be a game. Like somebody posting Call of Duty in like Russia. So it's like, what? It's not. <laughs> uh, uh, Scott, I'm reminded. So I ask you this. Is this Battletoads? Yeah, <laughs> is this Battletoads? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, so they're like, shit, what do we do about this, guys? So Valve decided what they would do, and this had nothing to do, as you might think. Valve did not talk to the Penny Arcade people about this at all. They just did it entirely on their own, 100%. They decided that if you want to get submit your game to Greenlight, you have to donate $100 to Child's Play, and then your game will be listed on Greenlight. So that way, it's sort of a filter that only a serious now, submission Now, the way it will works is you there. pay Valve, and they just pass all the money to Child's Play. Exactly. So it's There's just no a fee. profit for them. Now... 
what amazed me was the gaming community's outrage at this. Well, they get it. Basically, their outrage was: look, these are indie developers. They have no money. Even if their game is successful, they'll have no fucking money because you know it sucks balls. We learned. Well, we learned. Yeah. Well, here's the <laughs> thing: a hundred dollars. If you're not serious, is a lot of money. I mean, if I'm, if I was, and if you're make, not, like, if you don't have a real job, if you're just a, you know, no, even that. If I was gonna make like T-shirts for Geek Nights, you know, the few hundred dollars it costs to print like the first run before I sell them, I'm not gonna shoulder that burden. But seriously, pretty much everything but the bottomest, bottomest tier. If you make a game that's worthy enough to be on Steam, you can afford the hundred bucks. You're gonna make the hundred bucks back. Yeah, the only thing I could say to that is, it could be. 20 bucks right it's like i don't think so who's gonna but nobody you know 20 bucks is gonna keep ah, out so so the steam, call of duty submission so steam is not the venue for everything what is their other goal to keep all the crap out i hate to say this if you cannot muster a hundred dollars your game probably not is above the minimum line of i would ever bother with it on steam that's the level of game like you know that i download from your website Mm, you know, it's, it's tough call. Also, if a game is that diamond in the rough where it really is, you know, worth being on Steam, people you can get the hundred dollars from somebody yes. else. And you don't have a hundred dollars, you could kickstart for that hundred bucks. Yeah, it's like if you've, you know, if you've got, if your game is worthy and you got some demo video or something, you'll get the hundred dollars from somebody. So if you are too poor to get, but the I money, do think that you could lower it and still get the same filtration effect in it, like fifty bucks, no problem. See, that's why I'm saying it's serving two purposes, kind of like how a uh, a captcha that involves logic or reasoning of some kind serves two purposes. A regular captcha nominally exists only to keep robots out, mm. but a slightly complex captcha also keeps idiots out. Mm. That is a very important function. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford the twenty. 20 bucks and you cannot get $20 from anyone. You cannot get anyone you know in the world to help you pony up a hundred bucks to get your game on Steam. What if you're from another country where a hundred dollars is literally like a fuck ton of money? Uh, even then, you can't get someone. You can't get, you know, some person somewhere. From a rich country. Anywhere. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's just to cut down on the total number of even, you know, relatively okay or they are actually a game even if they're a bad game submissions mm -hmm. because green light is useless unless the submissions are low enough for one or two people to go through all of them all the time mm -hmm. that make it to the top and to curate a little bit and make sure something crazy doesn't happen and whatever the other thing is you know i kind of mentioned this before but the gaming community seems to have completely missed the real reason for this it's not so that a game that is great will guaranteed be on Steam because games that are great that anyone notices will get on Steam anyway. If there's any game that is not noticed, it's probably going to get on Steam. So let's say someone in a very poor country makes a game and they can't get the 100 bucks, And there's no way, some magical world where they cannot in any capacity get anyone to believe in them enough to help them get 100 bucks. If anyone even finds the game and realizes that it's good... It'll still get on there because Valve can just take a game and reach out to people and say, hey, let's do it. This is only to catch games that Valve didn't notice. Mm -hmm. That's true. So, um, speaking of Steam, right, in the Steam beta, there's two really interesting things. One of them everyone knows about is Big Picture Mode, which is Steam working on your TV. I tried it out. Did you try it out? I did not yet. So here's how it works. First, got to activate Steam beta. To do that, you go to Steam, Settings, Yes, I want to participate in the beta. You restart Steam, and then there's a thing in the top right of Steam. You can activate Big Picture. I saw that there's a uh, Steam Mover replacement in there. Well, hold on. That's the second thing I'm uh -huh. talking about. So uh, you activate Big Picture, and then you push the button, and the Steam takes up your whole screen. And it's sort of like using you know, your Xbox with your gamepad, right? It's like this user interface to navigate Steam from your couch. It has a web browser. It's not a good web browser. But it's the best web browser you can make with a gamepad, which is pretty impressive, right? It's like, man, this real user interface is really bad for browsing the web, but this is the best you could do. You know, I've always said, and as Yumi and Connor had talked about at length at PAX, if anyone's going to make 
a thing that will be the, you know, PC, HTPC gaming console that is generic, it'll be Valve. Yeah. The best thing about it is the t- way you type it without a keyboard. Basically, you push, you enter like a text box or something, and this thing shows up on the screen, and you use the left stick to select a blob, and the blobs are in a big radius, so it's a radial menu. And each blob has four letters, and the four letters map to the four buttons on the right side of the gamepad. So you hold, like, into the top right blob, and that'll have, like, H-J-K-L. So it's, like, red is H, yellow is J, blue is, Oh, my God, that's really nice. I just had flashbacks to the days of trying to type in a Metal Gear password without fucking it up. Right, so it's like, man, if, you know, Nintendo would have come up with that back in the NES days for typing in passwords... Yeah, but I guess you, it was only four direct, any anyway, eight directions, not enough really. Eight times two buttons is only 16 possible letters. So you make passwords that only have 16. Thing is, I, it's yeah. interesting. I feel like kids who were playing games in that era could not have dealt with that. No. And the user interface wouldn't have updated quick. Maybe you could make it anyway. The point is, it's a really good typing thing. Uh, the rest of it, basically, when you open a game that supports game pads uh, by default, and is full screen by default, it's beautiful. It's like you're using a console. It's like you go boop, and a game opens full screen, and your gamepad is still working, and it's great. When you open a game that is default to opening in window mode, or you know maybe doesn't support gamepads at all, or you have to configure the gamepad before it'll work, then suddenly everything is immediately ruined, mostly, once you o- open that particular, launch that well, game. Well, one step at a time. It is a beta. Yep. Uh, well, I mean, it's the, you know you can't do much about these games though. You have to update all these games. Yeah, well, I feel like the, the one of the killer apps for the complete replacement of these consoles, like the Xbox, where you actually just have a Steam box of some kind, will be when Valve helps developers not be dumbasses. Right, there but I'm talking like if you game where I have to use Joy to Key yeah. on Steam. But I'm talking about like if you open up some old existing game, like future games probably will be you know, but it's an existing well, two game. Things. One, I would do something on Valve where if any game could be certified to be. You know, compatible with the big box mode, the big screen yeah, mode. Yeah, and then you can easily filter those games out of the list that and aren't then certified. What I might do is offer like some like come up with some tools that will make it relatively easy for people to get that certification. Like to take their old game and like re you know, edit it to make it work with the game pad and the full screen and everything. Yep. And then I'd find some third party, because you don't want Valve Valve wouldn't want to do this themselves. Find some third party to partner with. And have them be able to offer a service of, like, we'll make your game All you work. really need to do to have a game work properly in big picture is when you launch it for the first time by default after installing it with no with default config, it needs to be full screen. It should be probably 1080p or 720p, detect the resolution from the OS, but it doesn't matter as much as just being full screen because you can change the resolution. And B, you need to be able to navigate all the menus and do everything in the game with the gamepad with the default configuration from the get-go. And that's all you really got to do. You've got those two things and your game run, and that's it. Um, but yeah, it was kind of nice, you know, and I'd probably use it for all of my Steam PC gaming that was good for a gamepad. And I sort of organized all my Steam games in the two lists, the gamepad HTPC games and the desktop games. And, you know, I realized most of those... Uh, one thing I realized is that most of those HTPC gamepad games yeah. were all like indie games. Ah. And most of the play at the PC sit down games, not all of them, but most of them were, you know, more for serious games that cost money and made by I big guess companies. without Valve make, like helping people out. I mean, look at Binding of Isaac doesn't just work with your gamepad. Yeah, but that is, that, I did put that one in the HTPC list. I would too, but I you really can't play it without the mouse and keyboard because you should not install garbage like Joy to Key. No, not at all. Uh, all right, so yeah. Oh, and that's the other thing I forgot. That rim reminded me, and I forgot, and I remember it again. So there is a hidden new feature. Yeah, this is big. You have to activate the Steam beta the same way, right? And here's the deal. There used to be, well, there is, this thing called SteamMover.exe. It hasn't been updated in a long time, but it still exists. And what Steam Mover does is, if you're like me, and you have program files on a solid-state drive, and you install every Steam game you've got, that's going to fill up that solid-state drive really quick, and then you're in big trouble. And it's, it's going to take you back to the, take you back to the past of, More the, importantly, of the DOS days where you got to delete one game to install another normal game. Normal person, you install Steam, it's on your C drive, 
yep. which has Windows and all your other bullshit. Then you edit video in Premiere, and you don't know better. So now it's caching all these HD video files on that same drive. Yeah, you want to. You want ideally, your Steam games take up a lot of space. You want to install them on a separate drive. If you're a nerd, you've almost definitely got more than one drive in your computer. Now, if computer. your computer is not already a tiny god, you want to install games that have high loading times and lots of disk crap onto an SSD so there's no loading times. Exactly. You would be very carefully choose which games go or on which drives. Or even not an SSD. What if you've got, you know, a lot of people a still raid. will do the 50, you know, a slow hard drive that's enormous and they put like, you know, their media files there and all their like kind of big crap there. Yep. And then you have a fast disk, even not an SSD, maybe it's just a 10,000 or 7,200 RPM drive. Yeah. But anyway, the point is you want to be able to install your Steam game somewhere that isn't program files because there are many and they are large. So the way you would do this up until now, the only way, safe way, was to use Steam Mover, which is something some guy made that he hasn't updated but still works. And what it does is it moves all the... You pick a game, you click the arrow, it moves all the files from that game to the other drive, and then it creates symbolic links in your program folder pointing at the game so that Steam doesn't know... Steam is none the wiser. And it even has a feature to let you move the games back to where they started, which is very good. And it works. But... It is no longer necessary because now there is a feature in the Steam beta, and what how it works is this. Uh, I'm gonna we're gonna link obviously to the instructions. You have to activate the Dev Steam console. You have to in run the install folder UI command. Hold out, command. guys! It'll be production soon enough. Yeah. Then you gotta add the directory to the installable folders list where you want to install things. So I made mine like G colon Steam or something. And then you, you, have, you can only change where a game is installed when you install it. So if you've got a game that's already installed that you want to move, you have to uninstall it. You know what's it, funny? G and colon install is it again. G colon is also my uh, data storage drive. Yeah, well, I mean, Windows starts at the same letters, so I, it's well, pretty I likely. C, C is my system disk. D is a little 100 megabyte disk I used for some bullshit. E is my SSD that I had before. G is my data store. F is my DVD. H, I, J, K, and L are all these various removable disks. I have all these. Uh, M, so many X, drives Z, now. Z, and Y are different Great. drives. Great. I don't think anyone Nazis. cares about your letters. Uh, I have so many letters, I don't even remember what all of them are because now I've collected. I basically keep, every time I get a new computer, I bring up the drives from all these old computers. Now I've got like too many drives. Yeah. I don't even need them all. And I got a NAS, so I moved so much data to the NAS. Like most of these drives are empty I now. I filled my two terabyte NAS. I got to pull stuff off it onto a secondary well, drive. Well, now I've got like a, a mega NAS. I got four two terabytes. So I got six terabyte NAS effectively. Uh, but yeah, you follow these crazy instructions. Then you uninstall a game and reinstall it, which should be okay because your save games should either be A, in the Steam cloud, or B, in your My Games folder or something. They won't be saved in program files. So uninstalling a game should not delete save games. Then reinstall, in most cases, check. The, it, it, mileage may vary Whatever, based I on Whatever, I delete game. save games all the time these yeah, days. I just if you don't care, care but I mean, it's like you don't need to save your Counter-Strike save game. There is no Counter-Strike, right? Uh, you uninstall a game, reinstall it, and when you reinstall it, you'll be able to choose where you want it installed, and that it will be officially supported by Steam and totally awesome. Uh, and this works so well, in fact, the only feature missing is the ability to move already installed games. Um, that I see uh, no reason why it's even in beta. They should just move this up to the real release as fast as possible, because I've had no problems with it whatsoever. Well, we'll see. We will. So, uh, one last thing. I just want to talk about this briefly. So... Uh, there is an article on Slashdot and a linked forum discussion and all this stuff, but the gist of it is that World of Warcraft, if you take screenshots within World of Warcraft... You, you have to use the World of Warcraft screenshot thing. Yeah. If you use, like, Fraps or something, this won't happen, right? Uh, as far as I can tell, yes. Okay. It has been, for pretty much ever, been watermarking your screenshots with all this information about you. So that way, when the Blizzard people can get screenshots they find on, like, Google Image Search... and So then they can be like, oh, that's the that troll, or, oh, these guys are running a private pirated server. They can figure out who took the screenshot and all kinds of stuff. I bring this up. Uh, I don't have a lot... Well, I do have a lot to say about it, but I don't really want to bog the episode down. Suffice it to say, check out this article. The people who figured this out and did all the research and decoded the what the watermarks are also provide a workaround if you take a maximum quality screenshot there are no artifacts presumably because people who are doing that big gigantic screenshot might have noticed more readily because people didn't really notice this for a long time mm. and the slew thing is how they figured it out and everything is awesome and i bring it up too because if you are 
in any amount savvy to the ways of the internet in relation to piracy, security, uh, nominal evil, hacking, all that kind of stuff, you realize there's watermarks like this and a lot of things you don't realize. like high Things quality, your printer prints out. Yeah, laser printers will very often use yellow dots. To, well, Destia, anything color printers will do this. Usually. Yeah, there's lots of watermarky stuff like this. So read this article, check it out, because as a gamer, this might affect you. And if you've ever posted screenshots from World of Warcraft, I can learn some stuff about you. Yeah, I do want to say one technological thing is that Blizzard seems to have outsourced the water. They just bought watermarking software yeah, from some like company. Yeah, it's like Digimark. Right, and the way it works is it basically in one area of the screenshot where there's a, a patch of the same color, it will slightly vary the color on a few of the pixels, right? Just so it'll be like there's, there's a blue area. They'll basically, in that blue area, they'll make sort of like a QR code you know, sort of thing by making some of the pixels like, okay, this one's like one darker than the one next to it, and this one is not, right? And then you can sort of scan it and get data like a barcode. What, the way you should do this to make it so it's not detectable by somebody you know, noticing, oh, look, this area has like these weird, slightly off-colored dots and sort of a pixelated arrangement. Which, to be fair, until recently... No Nobody, one notices shit like that. It's true. It, it's hard to notice, but to make it impossible to notice is you basically find blue all over the screenshot and you scatter the pixels all about, and then you just have a system that knows where to read from. So it goes forward until it finds the beginning, and then it goes through. So it's like, you know, it'd be like if I took a barcode and sort of shattered it and put the pieces all over the screenshot in different areas, there wouldn't be enough different pixels in any one area for anyone to actually find it. So it's so, like, I'll put like your name over here and I'll put your, you know, account username over here and the date and time of the screenshot well, over got, here. Well, steganography is a very interesting subject. You could go even deeper and use but it, variants of pixels. Oh, yeah. But I'm saying is that small modification enough if they had done that, we would still not. This wouldn't even be a story today. Now it's interesting that would have been enough to keep it a secret, probably forever. This was introduced, uh, quote, immediately or soon after patch 2.1.0. That uh, was a long time ago. Yeah, if you're not a World of Warcraft person, <laughs> that is 2007. World of Warcraft's old. Yeah. So check this out. But if you are one of those people who is not savvy to the internet, I'm give you a little hint. If you're ever engaging in screenshots or audio or anything that could be compromising and you don't and you want to post it publicly somewhere or reveal it somewhere but simultaneously do not want it traced back to yourself you should lower the quality and run things like blurring filters, but not Gaussian blurring filters, <laughs> and slight crops, and slight uh, skews and transformations, uh, run audio compressors over things, re-encode to JPEG a couple of... There's things you should do, because stuff like this is way more common than you think. I mean, if Blizzard is doing it in World of Warcraft... Right, but you know, a lot of the times, though, let's be honest, you make a screenshot in World of Warcraft... Do you really? It's like, okay, here's a picture of a guy wearing a fuck ton of armor. Here's a picture of a monster. Here's a picture of a rat. Ah, but, so. Do you really care? This watermark is here. Say some smart dudes figured, out, figured this out a long time ago. They could use information that you don't know is being watermarked. Like, a lot of people upload pictures and don't realize they're uploading EXIF data, too. That's true. That's not a watermark. That's straight up. It's just like, here's the GPS location where I took this picture. Here's my camera and the lens I was using. Yeah, but sometimes you want to upload exit data on purpose. Like, here's the camera and the lens I used. Yeah. But the other, all right, here's a picture of my bunny. Oh, I guess people know my address now. Well, or they can, you know, know at least the building you're in. If yeah. you're in a house, they know exactly where you are, suburbia. <laughs> Security and apartment buildings. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, know what? I'm in one of these hundred apartments. Anyone who ordered a T-shirt back when we were selling them, you have my home address. You know what? Doesn't my, help. My, I have a doorman. Doorman won't let you in. My address is on the stupid newsletter because Mailchimp makes you put an address there. Ooh. Ooh. What are you gonna do? You want to come over and visit? Fine. Let's play some video games. Hey there. But anyway, things of the day. So this is kind of amazing, but it also makes me feel old. So I will preface this by saying the following. I do not recognize a single one of these magic cards because I quit playing magic 
when Fallen Empires came out. I started playing Magic when Fallen Empires because came out. The or slightly before of Magic then. Players and tournament people. I used to go to tournaments. I was a. I, was I went really to one tournament, and we it was it was a uh, Homelands had just come out, and, or no, or Alliances or. Ho- yeah, alliances had just come out. Really, and, the last tournament and I went then to, then I stopped playing Magic. Literally, the last tournament I went to, like I kind of quit Magic in quotes, but it I was kept middle playing. school. But the last tournament I ever went to, which was actually the last game of Magic I ever played, not counting when we busted out those starter decks at PAX, was a tournament where alliances had been announced and come out like a uh, two days before. So uh, the tournament, I remember there's a big sign that was like, "No alliances cards, you will be disqualified." <laughs> And, I, I mean, I used to play when a Type 2 tournament went, I meant, I think, Revise, The Dark, and Fallen Empires. I played in a Type 2, which meant you couldn't use, uh, yeah, you could only use certain things that you were, could like, use pr- the current, that are currently available. You could, no, you you could use, use the current main game, and you could use the... Which was 4th edition the, at the time. Wow, yeah, for me, I started playing before Revise existed. Yeah, I, I played... When revised came into existence, I have a, a pile of beta cards. Like when I read about beta, it was like, "Whoa, there were sets before this." I just found out about this game, and I'm late. In fact, when Fourth Edition actually, came out, I wasn't I late. All I was ridiculously bitching. early. We were like, "The cards don't look as good anymore, and the game's stupid now." This I, is bullshit. I think Fuck the cards game. looked better. They improved the printing process, made the colors brighter, and revised. They were all sort of faded. No, see, th- th- hold a revi- That's because they were old. <laughs> hold a revised card that's freshly no, printed. No, you open up a brand new revised. Package and, and a brand, open new, up fourth a brand edition. new fourth edition. Fourth edition looked like shitty laser jet like crap. No, printing. the fourth edition w- look was had a much greater saturation and yeah, it was the, oversaturated. The, it looked the, like no, garbage. The revised one looked like someone had sandblasted. Magic the cards card. didn't look good again until Ice Age. No, the Ice dark, Age looked the same as fourth edition. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. It was like night and day. No. Anyway, mm-hmm. so. Kids, uh, fun fact, you can tell the difference between Alpha, Beta, Unlimited, and Revised based on the primarily the borders. Alpha and Beta have I black borders. I think the kids know more about Magic than we do, considering so, we haven't played it in a years. I don't years. think the kids know about old Magic. Maybe not about old Magic, but they know they about know. Magic in general I don't more think than they know do. what a fucking Sol Ring is. They do. It costs one colorless mana, but when you tap it, it's an artifact. It gives yeah, you those two are, colorless Those are restricted mana. cards. That card was... I have one. It was basically mega one, illegal. I have a pile of them. <laughs> well, anyway. I only had very... I didn't have that many revised cards, because when I, I, I played when revised was there, my friend had a bunch of revised cards, and then... I started playing, and when I went to the store, Revised was like expensive on its way out, and in was coming the night. It was like that moment. It was when I actually bought it myself. Thing is, fourth edition was just a gimped version of Revised that took out all the good cards. That's correct. And Unlimited was even better. I mean, back in the day, Icy Manipulator was basically the way you would interpret the rules: tap this to tap, or use it to tap any card, yours or an opponent's, and the implication was, and activate that tap power. mm Hmm. But uh, they since continuously gimped the Icy Manipulator. Yeah, the Ice Age version of the Icy Manipulator has to, A, tap itself, making it so you couldn't just tap the other guy's whole loadout, which you could do with the original one because it didn't tap itself, and B, the rules really specified. And everyone that, talks yeah, about the Black Lotuses like they were the biggest deal. No, the Moxes were the big you deal. You could still use an Icy Manipulator to like, tap a dude's land, and then he would have one less land that turn. Oh, so exciting. So much better than tapping his assassin to kill said assassin. Well, you could tap his really big creature so it couldn't attack that turn. Tap his really big creature to attack fucking him. Or you could tap something, and then you could use some other card that said... Do this to something that's tapped and be like, oh, there we go. All right, I'll make a reference. I'll use League of Legends players. I don't know if any of you kids will even get this. Tap Tim to do damage to him. (laughs) Yeah, that was the original interpretation. (gasps) Anyway. So check out my thing of the day. I didn't even say my thing of the day. Good job. So this is a Turing machine constructed with a 50 magic card combo where the cards beget other cards functions. This is some crazy shit. Yeah, it is. And again, I do not recognize a single card that is mentioned here. Not even one? Not even not one. Not even the basic lands? All right, let's see. Here's, here's one of the there cards. There has to be a basic land there. They're not listed. Oh. Tezia, comma, Orzyov, Skyon. Legendary creature, human advisor. Sacrifice three white creatures. Why would you do that? Remove target creature from the game. 
This is not a card you would use in a real game. Whenever another black creature you control, now uh, another black creature you control, is put into the graveyard from play, put a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying into play. This is a 2-3 creature that costs one colorless, one white, and one black mana. And the symbol on it, I have no fucking idea what that is. It also has a black border. I don't know what that means anymore. It makes me wonder, like, is current magic, like, creatures are actually good? Because when I played Magic, you basically, what? if you wanted Improvise, to win... My green creature deck would kick the shit out of you. No, no, no. But I'm saying it's like in the day when I played, the way to win was to basically Whoa. have no creatures. Whoa. Mind bend. Instant. Change the text target permanent by replacing all instances of one color word or one basic land type with another. That's a great card. For example, you may change non-black creatures to non-green creatures or forest walk to island walk. But then there's a sentence at the end. This effect doesn't end at the end of this turn. Right, it's permanent. Yeah, but it's an instant. Right, so you play this and you would change your As circle opposed of protection to red, which is the normal way to, to do that. To circle of protection blue. Anyway, anyway. what's your thing? So I noticed that Conrad's Twitter avatar changed to what appeared to be a drawing of Miles Edgeworth with a Daft Punk helmet. And I did I also like, notice that. And I was like, man, that is the perfect Twitter avatar for someone of Conrad's nature. That is awesome. Uh, and then I saw a link like a few minutes later, and I played this link, and onto my screen came Phoenix Wright, and I said, huh, I wonder if this is a, uh, yep, it's related. <laughs> What this is, is somebody took a song, which is a, I guess the song is by the Mystery Skulls, it's called Money, or it's the song called Mystery Skulls by a band called Money, I'm not sure. I think it's, the band is Mystery Skulls because the URL is mysteryskulls.bandcamp.com. And they made an animated uh, video to this song on their own, it's not a real official work, it's by a fan, and basically... It starts with Phoenix Wright sort of slamming his hands on the table on the beats. And then it gets pretty crazy and totally awesome. And the song's not half bad. So you should watch this for internet awesomeness. It's pretty cool. So because my thing of the day wasn't video, I have one more thing of the day. You may remember in the old days, Dance Dance Revolution was the game. Yep. And there was a dude. Dude's name was DJ 8-Ball. He's probably still alive. DJ 8-Ball was famous for faking a limp for an extended period, showing up at a Dance Dance Revolution style tournament. With a cane. Not a perfect attack. With a cane. And everyone's like, all right, he's going to take the stage and do the best he can. And the cane was incorporated into his routine and his leg was just fine. The crowd went bullshit, batshit. It was crazy. But... And the routine wasn't half bad. I'm not linking to that video. I'm linking to a video which is clearly made with a camcorder. Yeah, (laughs) all the videos of DJ 8-Ball are so low quality. This is Some guy with a crappy old camcorder. This is from October 13th, 2001. Yeah, you you really didn't have high-resolution digital video cameras in 2001. Somehow, in 2001, however, we saw this video. Yep. This is DJ 8-Ball performing Cafe. Doubles. On a Dance Dance Revolution 4th Mix machine. 4th Mix Plus, I believe. The best machine. In a tournament where he won the shit out of it. That's right. Uh, so I just want to point out something I learned today. The current version of DDR, I think, is X3. It is. I played that in Japan. DDR X3, I learned from... I also what, have every song from it in Step Mania. From Wikipedia, has a mode in it known as second mix mode, you basically can turn it into a second mix machine with all 30 second mix songs plus two extra songs. What? Wait, 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 wait. It turns not, into not, a sex, second X, mix machine. X2 or second mix? Second mix, as in the second DDR ever. The, Whoa. Also, all of every single one of those second mix songs is available in the X3 mode. So you can just play the regular X3 and have access to the full second mix library. This makes me wonder. X2 did not contain a DDR first mix mode. But first mix sucked. Will they did. Will DDR X4 contain a third mix mode? If so, let's buy an but X5 third, machine. Third mix has a lot of overlap with second mix. However, fourth mix is when everything changed. Will DDR X5 or whatever version that is have a fourth mix mode? If so, how much money can we get together to Less finally I checked, buy a DDR machine? Last I checked, fourteen thousand dollars. I do not rate. have that much money. I do, but I probably shouldn't spend it on a Dance Dance Revolution machine. Let's go. <laughs> Quarter Z's. I pay one quarter and you pay three quarter. 
How about I just continue to play in Step Mania, but we buy some like Cobalt Flux hard pads? Why don't we uh, somehow emulate it in MAME and then the real X, you know, DDRX, whatever in MAME by downloading it? Because I don't care it. about the. All I care about from the arcade, really, but it is would be that the dance true, pad. I know, but it would be the true we just software did a lecture arcade on this. experience. At PAX, we did a lecture on this. You forget how amazing the dance pads are in DDR. They're, I don't forget, they're perfect. Oh my god. Let's buy an arcade just the dance pad part. And then What are you gonna hook that up to? A computer running an Arduino. A computer yes. running MAME. With an Arduino. No. Scott, what you don't have you seen how those connect to the machine? It's you USB. Just, no, it's not. Yes, it is. No. It well, doesn't it's not physically USB, but digitally it's USB. Uh well, maybe they changed it because the last time I checked when I was trying to make a pad, I did make, you guys, to make me feel really old a long time ago, a hard DDR pad out of metal and wood yep. with plexiglass and everything. And I looked up and tried to like bu buy an arcade pad and use it, and the connector and the standard and everything for it was bullshit. It's got all kinds of crazy weird wires coming out of it, but you can definitely make it work because you know what's inside the DDR machine? Now a computer. A PC. It's always been some sort of normal PC Yeah, in computer. the old days, it was like a DVD or a laser it was disc. A, it was, there were laser discs in there, but you know what was reading the laser discs? They La were just laser disc readers, like LD ROMs hooked up to a computer and a monitor. Actually, the new DDR machines are really nice in that they have uh, a, a widescreen LCD instead of a... Uh, CRT? Yep. That's pretty nice. But I can't do my Matrix walk anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wonder if anyone knows what that is. Uh, Here's a hint. If you did that at an arcade, you would probably get beat the shit out of. Yeah, probably. Anyway. <laughs> so, meta moment. We're in and out of town. <laughs> we recorded the show at some point in the distant past, actually, and it's up now because I'm in Mumbai right now. Uh... Geek Nights is awesome. You should listen to us. Yeah, and check out our You forum. should check out our places on the internet that we have it, which is all the places. Check you out our videos. Many of you found us from PAX. You realize a lot of our videos of uh, panels and lectures from PAX are just on YouTube. Email newsletter, we have that. Uh, we have Twitter, Facebook, book all Book Club things. Book is the man who was Thursday. We'll uh, do the show on it real soon. The next Book Club Book will be something. It's Scott's pick. I think I know it's going to be. And then I'm doing The Great Gatsby right after that. So Okay, I, I'm picking, uh, I'm going with my strategy of book I own I haven't read. Ah. So I have to save myself some money. The thing is, I'm going to read Richard Garfield's uh, gaming book, so I got to squeeze that in. Well, don't make that the book club book, because I don't really, not that interested. You're really not that <laughs> interested? Yeah. Well, now it's the book club book. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's not The ga Great Gatsby. I fooled you. All right. Anyway. So Pax. It was what? another PAX, the same as all the other PAXs before it, only different. Uh, yeah, there were there were a surprising number of... Well, it wasn't that there were a lot of changes to PAX in the like fundamental spiritual sense, but there were a lot of logistical changes to PAX. There are many things we can discuss about this PAX. We will not discuss the things that are common to all yes, PAXs. Yes, if you want to know about PAX in a general sense or anything we did not talk about, listen to... Any of the episodes yes. I'll link to. We will only discuss things that are unique to this PAX or unique to our experience at this PAX. So, first off, we went to PAX Dev. So, we were actually in Seattle from Tuesday on. The onward. PAX Dev badge says, do not talk about PAX Dev or you'll be banned from PAX Dev well, and all Well, it says, do not PAXs. talk about the specifics of any talk. So, I think we can review PAX Dev in a general sense. If you are a dev, you should probably go to PAX Dev. If you're interested in game design... And you are serious about that. like Because you, that makes it worth the cost of entry. It's if like you're not just a cheap. gamer or you're like, a, like, I'd like to make games, but you don't, you don't care, you don't know about it. If you haven't played like some German board games, you've not played Doom 2, you're not a programmer, you're not an artist who's like deep into gaming, don't go to PAX Dev. It's not for you. It's not worth the amount of money you have to pay to get in. <laughs> but... If you are serious, you're actually a game designer, you work in the industry, you should go to PAX Dev just to, you know, hang out with all the other people. And we can't say anything else because we don't want to be banned from PAX Dev and all future PAXs, Dev or otherwise. Yes, though we did do our uh, panel, uh, uh, Academia versus Reality, Psychology, uh, Game Theory and Games, and it went very well. It did. I can't say anything else, but it went really well. I learned a lot that I it, can't talk about. We can about. say that it existed because it's on the public PAX Dev schedule. I will say this. You know what sucked? We did our 20-minute lecture at PAX Prime on the ethics of mind control, and 
we learned some things at PAX Dev that I really would have liked to have been able to say in that panel that we couldn't. Anyway, so regular PAX. Regular PAX. The uh, keynote was okay. It was basically sort of like a corporate. Mo- it was the guy who made Spyro the Dragon and Ratcheting. I'm going to say the harshest thing I can say, and dude, I'm, I'm sorry to sound so harsh. It was a wannabe TED Talk. Yeah. But it's like he didn't really have anything that inspiring, and it's like it sort of makes sense he wouldn't have anything inspiring because this is going to be even harsher. All you do is you made like three franchises and a huge pile of sequels, and most of the time, most of the innovative stuff you did that he even bragged about was all the creative weapons he came up with. It's like, yeah, that's you know the part of the game industry that I give no I know, fucks my, about. My favorite keynotes are still uh, McGonagall... The first one we went to and the second one well, we Warren went to. Did Warren Spector do one, I think, was good? We already mm-hmm. forgot we're old men. Yeah. Name anyone who's done a keynote uh, at PAX. I'm pretty sure Warren Spector did it. All right, right name anyone else. Uh, what's that guy's name? That guy? It's the guy from... Um, Will Wheaton did the one of the first PAX East. Yeah, that's an easy. That's too easy. Uh, I think if I had to rank them, it's the Ken Levine one in, two, in 08, which is our first PAX. Yep. It's hard to, you know, it's hard to compare any PAX because... The first PAX I went to was in many ways the best one I went to, but it was mostly because I'd never experienced a fan convention that good before. Mm-hmm. I mean, I went into it when before that PAX. There was something that I think the reason that PAX was so great in my memory, not just because it was my first giving it a personal significance to well, me I mean, and the, the novelty of the experience, but because at that PAX 08, PAX still was not at full capacity. So there was a much it was it was much more intimate in its size. Like going to see a concert, literally, where there's less people at the concert, you get this more intimate setting than when you go to the stadium concert. And now any PAX you go to, even if it's your first PAX, you get the novelty aspect, but it's stadium arena concert all the time. Whereas PAX 08 was still small enough to be intimate, and the PAXs before that were even more intimate, and I'm very sorry I missed them. It was my regret for the rest of my days. But there's a little more to it than that, because one, before I went to that PAX, the be- like the benchmark of great convention, the best conventions I'd ever been to were Oticon. Yep. So I was comparing everything at that PAX to the best convention I'd ever been to, and it was so far beyond it yeah. that I... It's telling that after, yeah, we yeah. pretty much stopped. So going anyway, this the current packs, packs, uh, 2012, packs prime. Let's see what was interesting. Number one, let's talk about the League of Legends area. They had this thing up in the top, taking up a big ass room, and the room was a hundred percent League of Legends, but it wasn't play League of Legends. It was spectate the North American Championships of League of Legends. So let me tell you, this, this was, shit was fucking epic. Yo. This was so professionally done, independent of whether I don't or not give you a like, shit about MOBAs. I think MOGA, MOBAs <laughs> as a genre are stupid, but yeah. that's fine. I think baseball is stupid too. I don't think it is stupid. I think it is a genre of game that has many fun aspects that I personally enjoy and really want to play. But there are many stupid things that are in the genre they won't remove that ruin it. And but League, Scott, League of Legends make it no longer the genre. League of Legends removes many of those things, but not enough of them. I put League of Legends on the same level as Major League Baseball, in my opinion, in terms of my like of it as a thing. Anyway, but seriously, this area was off the hook. I was when it's I walked like, in. It's like it's like you're thinking about like the wizard, right? You know, with the freaking Nintendo World Championships. This was way beyond that. This was like, whoa. They had professional commentators and it was packed over capacity. The, the whole convention, people were packed in there watching, cheering, screaming and it was it I was, was there at the end of I think the semifinals or whatever and suddenly one guy ganks jungle deep something another <laughs> boat sinking dude I don't know I'm an old man and the crowd goes crazy and then the announcer starts to explain what happened and it was just it was louder than the omegathon finale it was great uh but I personally and Rim's going to argue against this right it sort of I even though it was awesome and big, even though I personally don't care about it, it's not because I personally don't care about it. If, let's say, let's say, for example, it had been the Counter-Strike Arena, right? I still personally feel that it should not be using space, this a large amount of space at 
PAX Prime, that is shared PAX space, should be dedicated to one, any one game. The square footage... You mean footage, like the Omegathon finale, which is dedicated to one game? That's not... That is main events area. It is used for many things. We are talking about a section of square footage All right, Scott, that is so dedicated one. to one game and only one game disproportionately for the duration of PAX. So right? you say disproportionately, that space could not have easily been used for much else. It caused other things at PAX to be moved around. It could have just been bigger Expo Hall. It could have been uh, more tabletop. It could have been PC area is so bigger. Tabletop it could have been was console much, replays bigger. Tabletop was pretty much never full. Uh, that's because they had this red line. The red lion tabletop might have had not to had existed. They could have just forgot no, the red lion. No, because there was more space for tabletop in the red lion and better space than that space would have been. And there's no area of PAX I would extend in there. And also... They it could was, have not had that stuff in the Hyatt. It saved a lot of money getting these extra hotels involved. They're going to need those extra hotels anyway if they want to increase They could have capacity. gotten those hotels and used this space and been like, well, PAX is just even bigger and more awesome. It was bigger and more awesome. That Think about that. that but event, adding, a, some, adding more to the generic things that everyone can enjoy and not to just w any one game. But I think why is, is one game different from two games in a space? I mean, if anything, even two Scott, games. If there's anything, I'd every get rid of, other area why? of packs is You're dedicated making an arbitrary to gaming and, and stupid distinction. It is not arbitrary. Of a thing no. that one, unlike the Halo area, which was stupid because hardly anyone went in there. Well, okay, so if what if everyone had been cramming into the Halo area, then it's okay. Yeah, because that no. means a lot. You know, packs is for everyone, and the, a lot of people at packs really like that. A lot and were did, there for that. But and I don't that think... space. Think about how crowded PAX was already this year. If all those people had been elsewhere in the convention... They would not have been elsewhere. They would have been in that area. It just would have been, you know, something Scott, else no, in that area. Nothing, and not an area dedicated no, to a single nothing, game. That area was just tightly packed chairs and then standing room. There is nothing that could have put that many people in that space. You could put things in that space. That would, that would occupy that many people. Could have been another theater. We could have had even more panel programming. Uh, one, that's a terrible place for a theater. It's out in the open. <laughs> no, but there was uh, the place that was, you know, there were other places that could, you know, for example, the console uh, free play could have been there, and then the current the current console free play could have been No, I went theater. into console free play a ton of times throughout PAX for the last several PAXs. Not that popular anymore. Eh, it's Didn't cause... need more space. Yeah, I'm just saying. And I point out that, you know, for all that, too, Everyone, people loved the League of Legends thing. The only people who complained about it were the people who equally suggest that the Expo Hall should have its own badge. Well, those are people that are crazy and stupid. Those are the same people. No. But you're I, in league with them. No, I'm not in league with them. A league. No, you're pulling the thing that's like, oh, well, you think, of, you know, this is wrong. So therefore, you know, you don't, you like abortion. Therefore, you must hate taxes. They have nothing to do with each other. They highly correlate, right? however. No, Expo Hall badge has no idea, has nothing to do with League of Legends. You know, I do not think that you should dedicate a large amount of square footage to a single you know game in that way and i'll show you the way to do it right is you may not have known this rim but the world championships of dota 2 were also at pax yeah but they were not in pax they were at Ben royal hall down the road yeah because valve said why should we take up all this space at pax and dedicate it to just our game i doubt one that's game. what valve actually said let us well, you think Valve, would they have rather had it at PAX? Considering if you look at pictures of the Benner Royal Hall, not too many fannies in the seats compared to the League of Legends area. But are you saying Dota 2 is less popular by that much? I don't think so. I think it's because they weren't at no, PAX. No, well, one, League of Legends has a much tighter... It was tighter, less visible and people No, independently, didn't know League of Legends there. has a much tighter professional gaming structure I think it. if you would swap them and move League of Legends to Benner Royal Hall and put Dota 2 no. in that space, that the crowds would have... sizes would have remained the same per space. No, because from Dota what I two see, one would have been crowded the, the, and better the professional Hall been... gaming fandom is not nearly as big or, and professional around Dota 2 as it is around League of Legends. I right think the Dota 2 is much bigger than the League no, of Legends. No, as a game, yes, but not the professional gamer no, media No, on the internet, coming into PAX, the hype around the Dota 2 championship was much larger than the See, hype around League of Legends See, I saw the exact one. opposite, so it's just anecdotes. And the, League, the Dota one was also the world championship and not just the North American finals. So it was even a bigger deal. And yet people it seem was to care about it less. It was only because it was in the PAX space that was made it more crowded.
You know, if you had put the Dota one in the packed space, it would have been just as packed as League of Legends one was. And if you put the League of Legends ones in the Benaroy Hall, it would have been as packed as the Dota one was at this pack. Anyway. I actually don't think so. I disagree with you. You think you're saying all those people would have gone down to Benaroy Hall? I think most and of those people would. packed it in for League and of Legends my... when they didn't pack it in and for Dota? And the reason I say this no. is that if you look at pictures from the Dota thing mm. versus League of Legends thing, the sheer number of League of Legends cosplayers is ridiculous. There are plenty of Dota cosplayers. And the other thing is that you, how can you even tell the fucking difference? Because most of the characters are the same goddamn thing. <laughs> anyway, I think your, if anything, Scott, I think your distinction is arbitrary and silly. Yeah. If I was going to remove something from PAX, I'd get rid of BYOC. It's a private I would area. not get rid of BYOC. Why? Have you ever, go to BYOC. While it's cool for the idea, it's usually about half full because the people are off doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just like private area people buy a special badge <laughs> for. And most of the people in there are just fucking playing World of Warcraft or Solitaire or dicking around single player. It's really boring and chill and I would use that space for something different. I think BYOC doesn't have a useful purpose at PAX anymore. Be uh, because, see, this is the thing I think you're wrong. BYOC is a specific culture. It is just not your Yeah, so culture. is League of Legends. No, League of Legends is a single game. The MOBA is a culture, Why right? You if you made that the generic MOBA arena, I would have much less a problem with Why? it. Why? Why do you have a problem with a single game having a big space? Because this is PAX. It is, is you know, for all gamers. And yes, Says you. players yeah, of League gamers. of Legends, so one players of League of Legends are gamers, yes. But you are dedicate the amount of space, it is disproportionate. You should provide equally for all the different kinds of gamers, you know, in terms Scott, of League square of attention. had way less space. In fact, MOBAs, as a total, had way less space than, say, tabletop. I think, but that's that's the thing that's fucked up. If you look at the proportions, yeah, they had less space in total. But think about this. Three, a single tabletop game, how much space did Settlers have compared to League of Legends? League of Legends had way more space than Settlers, which is just one game. And you know what? Settlers, not that popular. I'm not saying. Okay, Dominion. How much space did Dominion have compared to... Probably more League than half of Tabletop. Compared to League of Legends. And why do you care? Who says that the games have to be represented in any equal proportion? That's I think ludicrous. there should be a, an equal representation of all gamer cultures at the get-together of gamers that is the best All right, get one, I think that's silly, too. Why don't we have a big, like, poker Because you don't want to marginalize any per one subset of the gamer culture. What if, like, you know, it's, you know, you had the miniatures stuff, which was in the red line and had plenty of space. What if it was just like, nope, we hate miniatures, guys. We're going to give one tiny table. Or what if it was like, we love miniatures, guys. We're going to have this giant room, Warhammer only. You know what? That'd be pretty cool if one year they had a nope. big Warhammer. And you try arena. to bring your you try to bring your war machine in there and like, nope. This is but Warhammer Scott, this only. wasn't a this was a spectacle. This was basically a big panel room for the whole time showing this competition. Yeah. I don't like that it was one game. I think you're just being silly and crotchety and old manny about it. Nope. I think and your argument if is If it ludicrous. had been Counter Strike, I would have had the same complaint. Yes, I think your argument is ludicrous in light yeah. of the fact that no other type of event could have used that space as effectively. You it would have been space that could have been used. For what? The Pl tabletop that wasn't full? There's plenty of the stuff console free at PAX. Play that wasn't full? There's plenty of stuff at PAX. You can always have all kinds of gaming going on. They never get a big arcade because they don't have sp even that space. They could, they could have had a big uh, arcade. No, Scott, that space. They just refused to. Because they have no good space for it, and PAX would destroy arcade machines. They Manifest have arcade gets, machines there. Yeah, a tiny number in a tiny room. That's on purpose. Yeah, they should get friggin' man up and get a big-ass arcade. Scott, they, they there's can too afford many it. The only reason it works at MAGFest is because not that many people go to MAGFest. It, that, if you could have a big arcade. This is proportionate to the number of people. Uh, no, you really can't. Magfest has pretty much the biggest arcade you could have at a convention reasonably. Why not? Why couldn't you have a large arcade with Power all kinds concerns, of crazy games? Money concerns, logistics. Yeah, the how much do you think that freaking League of Legends thing cost? Probably not that much, actually. <laughs> the, in fact, the cost of League of Legends things in terms of running it was probably mostly the labor. They're, they can do anything they want. They have mad monies. They could have a mega awesome super arcade. Uh, Scott, who paid for all the League of Legends the stuff? The League of Legends guys. Yeah, so if PAX does an arcade, who pays for that? Whoever's got the arcade. Uh, No, you mean PAX. Why would I pay to bring my arcade to PAX? Make people put quarters in. Uh, No, it's free. Why does that have to be free? 
Because if it's not free, almost no one's going to go over to it. MagFest is free because otherwise people wouldn't put quarters in. I think in. if you had a giant Uber arcade that had a fucking everything and you had to put quarters in, people would put quarters in. That's silly. Anyway, I, I just think you have this weird fixation on League of Legends and mobile. It has nothing to do with League of Legends. I said I if it, it was Counter-Strike, if it was if the whole area was Dominion only, I would have said, that's fucked up. You have this one giant room that's All Dominion right, Scott, only. I'll put it this way. This was not the League of Legends only area in essence. What it really was was the professional game gaming area and it so happens if it was the professional gaming area it should have switched between different professional uh gaming in the u.s competitions mobas are the only professional gaming worth anything no there is plenty what are you talking about there is huge rts fighting games yeah other fps gaming and they don't get nearly the press that the mobas are getting no at least at this moment there is plenty of professional gaming of all kinds. The RTSs are huge. And I think the MOBAs huge. have a lot more momentum right now. At this exact moment, there is, but there is huge professional gaming in many, many genres. Yeah, and I'm saying I think MOBAs no. are overshadowing all of, them, no. all of them. And give it six months, and you're going to yeah. see MOBAs dominating American professional gaming. No, there is professional gaming of all kinds that is all huge all over the place. Yeah, the Settlers That's complete giant bullshit. tournament, not that huge. Yeah, okay, whatever. It's not. All right, so let's go to other things that are different at PAX besides this thing that Rim is wrong about. The thing that Scott has a ridiculous obsession with. That thing that, that Rim can't get over. I just don't over. understand why you have such a bug up your butt about one professional thing that was super popular at PAX. It's um, because you dedicated a large area of PAX to one thing. What if there was a whole area of PAX that was just... Uh, I think we've said the same thing over and over again a hundred times. Yeah, and I just you you haven't changed your argument. What I, if you went to Otakon and there was one gigantic room and that room was the Evangelion only room? That'd be cool. What are they just marathoning Evangelion? It's it's only thing that's in there is Evangelion, and it's taking up like this gigantic room, and that's all it is. There's no other animes in all there. All right, so or is anything. that room completely packed for the entire con with people lining up trying to get in? Yeah. Then yeah, that's awesome. So you got no problem with that? No. See, I think that's fucked up because it's supposed to be an anime con. It'd be it's sort of fucked up to represent have one thing over represented. You mean in have that one way. thing that's ridiculously popular represented to a relative proportion of its popularity? Yes, I think a convention is better when it equally services all of its subcultures, right? Because you the idea of packs is all right, Scott. So then Kineticon had better equally service the furries. It does equally service the furries. We had one furry panel. I denied all the rest. That is imp- there. That is panel wise. There is plenty of furry service at Kineticon in proportion to the number of furries who are there. Uh, how so? There's a lot of them there actually. Way more than the relative panel there, content. It, just, just panel content you're looking at. There is plenty of things at Kineticon for furries to do. They are very happy there, and they come off. But they're and not they are dedicated welcome. to furries. There are many things at Kineticon that are dedicated to furries. All right, fine. Oticon, huge furry culture. Basically nothing for them. There are things at Kineticon Only for unofficial furries. cosplay photos. There are plenty of things like in what? the dealer's room and the artist alley. What? What in the dealer's room? There's plenty of people selling furry shit in the dealer's room. Also, the, what's in the dealer's room, that content is not run by the convention. It's still content. It's still a proportion of the convention is dedicated to... The things that they want. That's right, why so they why are come. you mad that Firefall? Aren't you mad that Firefall is this gigantic area in the Expo Hall? That's the Expo Hall, and the Expo Hall was not the Firefall Hall. It was the Expo Hall. Anyone yeah, and who pays the Firefall money had this gigantic there. edifice inside of it. Yeah, and they bought it. That was part yeah, of the Expo so Hall. Yeah, so League of Legends bought that bit. It was okay. Consider if, that part if, of the Expo Hall. No, that, it, Scott, it, that's just the annex of the Expo Hall. No, it's not part Why of the Expo Hall. It was the League of Legends area. If yeah. It, it was, if so they Scott, put it in the Expo Hall. Would you have had a problem if that was just in the Expo Hall? No. It was the League of Legends area in the Expo Hall? No, that would have been okay. But they're the same thing for no, all intents and purposes. No, it's not. It's a specialized separate area. It was not integrated in the Expo Hall next to all the other Expo Hall things. What if, there was an Expo, what if they just called it the Expo Hall annex and it was the League of Legends thing the whole time? That would be kind of then. It, see, it, it's, that's like, did they enlarge the expo hall by a whole room just to give it to them, or was it here is this giant expo hall? They happen to buy a large piece of it. That's the difference. Who cares? It doesn't. Th- that intent doesn't matter. What it does matters matter. is that it was super popular. And I you think still show, can't. Why can't you just get off this? Because you bring it up constantly. I brought it up once, and you wouldn't let it go. And now we spent like the whole pack show talking about this yeah, one. So we got thing. it long enough. This isn't the pack show. It's that show, and we'll call it a night. <laughs> okay, fine. This 
This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 